Welcome to The First Time with me, Matt Everett. This is the series where we meet some of the most influential and best-loved musicians around and look at the seminal first musical moments that shaped their lives and their careers. And this week's show is a Glastonbury special and features the frontman with Friday Night's Headliners, a band that's managed to achieve worldwide success, attract huge critical acclaim, while all the time maintaining their integrity as one of the most original groups of the past decade. My guest this week on The First Time from Arcade Fire is Wynne Butler. Here I speak to Wynne about the band's emergence from the club scene in Montreal in 2001, the first recordings and breakthrough album Funeral, and the massive success of their 2010 record The Suburbs. Wynne also talks about his own musical influences, the artistic ethos behind the band and their slightly uncomfortable relationship with fame, and Wynne's first trip to Haiti, a trip that shaped their most recent album, Reflector. But I started by asking Wynne, as I do with all my guests, when was he first aware of music? My mom's a harpist, so I remember she would always be practicing, I, and I, I really remember being very young and hearing her play Debussy, which is on the harp, which is like really rolling beautiful chords and it was very magical very magical sounding so it definitely would have been my mom either playing the piano there's lots of pictures of me as a little baby like in her you know she'd be have like a shirt that i'd be stuffed into and she's playing the piano at like two in the morning you know kind of vibe and she would uh, put me under the table at nightclubs and she had gigs and stuff so i was around a lot of music what about the first music that was yours that you kind of that you owned yeah i mean probably very first would have been probably like michael jackson thriller or something like that it was like because my parents didn't listen to a lot of popular music but that was like the one thing that i think was like monoculture like kind of made it everywhere um but for myself i mean so it's an interesting journey that journey when you start to find your own things that maybe just aren't as you say in the mainstream you yeah. start your, your little paths through to bands. i mean it's a little bit later but i mean Probably The Cure was one of the first things that I remember really hearing on the radio that felt different, you know, that was big enough that it made it to a radio station that I could actually hear, and that felt really different from the rest of the stuff that was on the radio at that time. So um, The Cure was a big entry point for me to like get into music that was slightly more alternative to what a lot of my friends were listening to in Houston, Texas. What did you like about The Cure, then? Um, well, it was, it had all the kind of trappings of pop music. It was really catchy and melodic, but, uh, there were a lot of kind of dark lyrical themes and, and it was also kind of cool, you know, you hear like a song from Disintegration or Wish, but then if you go back and get the back catalog, it's, it, you see this incredible progression from like more industrial kind of drum machine stuff. And so, I mean, a lot of the bands I was really into, you know, had either broken up or been around for so long that you could kind of like navigate the whole back catalog and yeah i mean that's something that i i always relate to our own music in that way where i think about it like try to think about it in terms of like some kid buying like neon bible and then working this way forward and backwards and trying to make sense of it all what about the first album that was yours that you owned i remember hearing it was like uh you know i was like maybe like eight or something and, and uh i I really like the song "Pour Some Sugar on Me" by Def Leppard, and <laughs> that's a good song. <laughs> and we were in, we were in the airport, and I saw like a Def Leppard cassette at the airport, and I was like, "Mom, give me some money, like, <laughs> trust me on this. I have to buy this." And I bought it, and it was like some weird album that was not that album. And, and I got it home and played it. And I was like, "What is this? Like, I do not like. I do not care for this at all." It's like some you know one of their lesser albums. <laughs> Just think, had, had you had you got that track, your musical career could have gone, yeah, gone completely. Could have gone completely. I was I was saved by the bell. When did you start going to see bands live? What was the first gig you saw? I mean, it would have been my mom or my grandpa. I mean, my grandfather was a uh, led big bands, and and so I, I saw them play. I didn't go to. Uh, I think the first big rock show I went to was probably U two when I was fifteen or sixteen in a giant you know like it's like the astrodome in houston it was huge but i didn't i didn't go to a lot of um because i went to a boarding school for high school um i mean i saw a few shows but i mean really where i started going to shows is when i was about 19 and i moved to montreal mm. and kind of jumped headfirst into the music scene there and so there was a band called the unicorns that gave us our first opening slot in the u.s 
that were signed by Rough Trade. They were the first kind of Montreal band that got signed yeah. in the UK, and that for me was really cool, being contemporaries with people that I thought were as good a songwriters as the stuff that I mm. liked from the 80s and 90s, but being in the same city with them and everything. You're listening to The First Time with me, Matt Everett, and my guest this week from Arcade Fire, Wynn Butler. And before that trail, you heard Jelly Bones by The Unicorns, the Montreal band who gave Arcade Fire their first support slots. I asked Wynn what those first Arcade Fire gigs were like. I knew I had to play music, and I was very driven to, I mean, I dropped out of school and moved to Boston with a friend that I didn't know that well, and pretty much spent a year, like, not leaving the apartment, just writing... <laughs> all day, every day, going to work, come home, right? So for me, it was more about wanting to create the whole mechanism of how to get a gig and how to play a show and all that stuff was, or labels, all that kind of stuff was so not on the radar. It was really just about writing and writing and writing and writing and writing. Getting your skills, honing your skills. I mean, I didn't feel like there was... I feel like for a lot of people, it's like kind of backwards where they're just thinking about who's going to release my stuff. And mm. I was just like, I want to make something good. That was my <laughs> goal. It's like, what I'm doing is not good, but I know that it can be good if I, you know, if we get the right combination of things. And yeah, and, and in Montreal, I was constantly trying to find new musicians to play with. And that's kind of how I met Regine. And then we had such a distinct writing style together. And then the whole thing kind of grew out of that grew out of that city and grew out of the two of us playing together. What were your first impressions of her when you met her? Um, well, I just kind of saw her across the room um, in a cafeteria. She looked really interesting. She was studying jazz, but not not really. I mean, more from an academic standpoint, I think. Mm. Um, but I saw her perform soon after that at, at an art opening and just seeing her sing with a piano player and you could tell that she was a really... She had a really distinct, really special kind of stage presence and, mm. s- and singing style. And then the first time we played together, she brought all these different flutes, and she she could play almost anything kind of immediately. And uh, I think that I was a real songwriter, too, at that point. So I think she was really relieved to meet someone who was actually really serious about it and not just thought it would be cool to be in a band. <laughs> being in a band is cool yeah. what were those first arcade fire gigs like because i mean you sort of read reports of them and that they're, they're although on a much smaller scale to what you do at the moment that kind of ambition of theatrics and a performance and something where the audience were involved seemed to kind of happen quite early on it was never just we'll turn up and we'll play and that'll be it and we'll have a couple of lights yeah, I mean, we the, the first shows where we really started to come into our own were kind of in Montreal. We'd play a lot of these weird dance shows or, or loft party kind of shows where you were in someone's home, like in a, in a space. And it was it was always small enough that I'd play acoustic guitar and be able to sing off mic and just kind of go in the audience and, mm. and kind of... I really remember wanting to really... Because I think people are used to going to a rock club and hearing music and just talking and having a beer. And and I think that our goal was always to really kind of connect with people and make a, make a moment and feel like there's a communication happening between you and the audience. And I think that whatever place we've been in as a band, we try to use the tools that are available to us to make this specific show work. I mean, still, like when we, we just played in Haiti for Carnival in February... And we brought the most bare bones equipment and ended up doing a show in this hotel where we had like two guitar amps, everything plugged into it, and um, the most basic ingredients and ended up just doing kind of like a total garage, <laughs> garage rock kind of 60s show. I mean, we're very in our element, like standing on the floor, no monitors, like really just making making noise. I think... I think in a way, that's what comes easiest to us. What can you remember of recording that first EP, first title LP, 2003? The lineup of the band at that point was kind of... We started to get a name for ourselves, but it was really kind of fraught internally, and it felt like it, felt like it wasn't going to last much longer, so I, I wanted to at least document what we had done <laughs> at that point because it felt like it could kind of fall apart at any moment. And so I really had to really convince everyone like we should really just record this so we before it goes yeah before it goes you never know when it's going to go and we kind of broke up on the the cd release of that first ep <laughs> on <timing>. stage pretty <laughs> much so yeah but then 
this kind of magical thing happened once that EP was out where it wasn't like this initial like people wanting to sign us or anything like that but people started to share the music because before that it was how do you get a gig like uh, I was so frustrated by the whole process of like I just wanted to play now like the idea of like booking a show four weeks in advance was just so it was like <laughs> why would you have to it makes no sense I want to play now like why don't why can't we just play tonight um, but once we had the EP people started to share it with each other like even pre-internet you know people just started to share it with each other and then our shows slowly started getting bigger like there'd be more people coming to check it out and after, and then after half the band kind of it broke up we were kind of left my brother had just moved to Montreal and it was like Richard, Tim my brother Regine and I and we had no drummer and we had this EP that was from a different group and so we had these really limited resources when we were writing a lot of that funeral stuff um, and I think part of that energy of just really it made us like focus in even harder because it was such a it was a really trying kind of period um, but yeah I think I think it made us kind of dig in a little bit deeper even because when funeral came out, I, I don't think I've ever witnessed a sort of body of work be so critically loved by everybody across the board, um, which I guess has got to be really nice, but also at the same time unusual to kind of suddenly be sort of fated as the great hopes of music. I mean, how did that feel when that first album came out? Well, I don't know that it was exactly like that. I mean, if you look at, it, like, the reviews on the next two records, on the average, are kind of the same. There was always one person who thought it was crappy, <laughs> and and but overall, people were like, no, this is pretty good. I mean, I don't think it was this, like, immediate... Um, like there were a couple early really positive reviews but it wasn't like this avalanche of love it was still very much a slow build because you know we we had no manager we weren't signed the record didn't come out in the UK until six months mm. after the US so we did a van tour across the US as Funeral came out and could tell it was starting to build like because we, we went across the whole US and by the time we got to San Francisco it was like okay this is really starting to really happen but it was still very much related to the live show. I mean, seeing images now of us playing in San Francisco at the end of that tour, it's like as punk as anything I've ever seen. It's like, <laughs> you know, Wills and Richie are banging on the walls and plasters falling off. And I was really sick and my voice is just sounds like a razor blade, just like ah, just screaming to try and get any sound out. So we were, you know, we've always been a band that's kind of all in or <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I, I it felt like a continuation of what we had been doing mm -hmm. already. It wasn't really until the end of the funeral tour when we started playing festivals and we had to get roadies and we had to start to navigate finding a manager and all that kind of stuff where it started to feel where we had to like figure it out again, like what, what our goal was artistically. I asked Wynn when he first heard Springsteen's music. I didn't really grow up listening to... Springsteen. It wasn't like my parents didn't listen to him. It wasn't something that I, I mean, I'd probably heard Born in the USA and was kind of aware of it. But when I moved to Montreal, the original Arcade Fire drummer was a big Springsteen fan. I remember hearing um, Born to Run and Thunder Road and like all the songs on that record. And it, and then really deeply getting in Nebraska was kind of the thing that was really my entry point to really get get bruce it's a very unflinching very real record and for someone who just done born in the usa to come back and do a record like that is is very inspiring you know it takes a lot of guts what should we play off that record oh man we used we used to cover uh state trooper i love that song it's like really it's like a little film noir in a song New Jersey. The Suburbs did so incredibly well. It was a, a US number one and a UK number one and kind of really put you into the mainstream in a way that doesn't happen for many bands. Not many bands get the opportunity to kind of enter that arena. Mm -hmm. Was it an intimidating thing to kind of suddenly be the hottest band in the world? Because it's never something that bands can prepare for and it's not necessarily something that may have been an ambition when you started to be an arena band. And then it happens. Um, I don't know. It... It didn't feel that different, to be honest. I mean, we did the Grammys and we did the Brits, and 
and it, we definitely feel like a bit of a fish out of water in those kind of scenarios. But I think if people are honest with themselves, probably everyone does. It's not, I don't, I can't imagine anyone who like wants to like hang out at the Brits all the time. <laughs> um, anything that involves us playing music for people, it, and, and as long as you know we don't, we're not having to compromise the integrity of the music that we're actually playing, then we usually enjoy it and we're into it. I mean, it's it's a different challenge and it's. It's it's really memorable. It's not like you do that kind of stuff every day. Um, so, yeah, it's just like a, a different artistic challenge. I mean, I remember seeing Nirvana on the MTV Movie Awards when I was a kid. And you think that they were like on top of the world. It was like, never mind, biggest record in the world. And you're like, oh, man, the whole world was about Nirvana. And then I, I saw it again recently. And the rest of the bands, it's like CNC Music Factory, <laughs> Aerosmith. You know, like Nirvana, the total weirdos on that bill. It's Guns N' Roses over there. Yeah, and they wanted to play uh, "Rape Me" and they weren't allowed to play it, so they had to play a different song. And it, like, even at that point, they didn't have power to get to choose what song they played, and they still had to kind of do this tap dance. And for us, I think that we've we've actually really had to compromise very little. You know, like on the Grammys, we played Month of May, which is like a total punk song. And the amazing thing was that the guy who runs the Grammys really wanted us to do that song because he loved the visual of the two drummers and stuff. And he, we were like, are you sure you don't want us to play <laughs> one of the singles? He's like, no, it'll, it'll be great. And we're like, like it was it was too weird to have the Grammys really wanting us to play Month of May. So we're just like, yeah, great, we'll do it. <laughs> As long as it's about music, then we're, st- we're right there. Peter Gabriel, you're someone who got asked to cover one of his songs, and he covered one of your songs, which is once again a great compliment, and another artist whose artistic sensibilities, I think, kind of get echoed in Arcade Fire yeah. to an extent. When did you first fall in love with his music? I mean, Regine was a huge Peter Gabriel fan, because she grew up in Montreal and Quebec, where the the kind of Peter Peter Gabriel era Genesis is like the biggest really? still in Quebec. I don't know It's that. huge. I think the 60s, what happened in a lot of the rest of the world in the 60s really happened in the 70s in Quebec. So a lot of the kind of progressive music from the 70s, those are like the archetypal kind of Big band. freedom of expression, cultural songs there. So she grew up just knowing every single peter gabriel record and every you know all the old genesis stuff and it's so i i kind of got more got into him through her mm. he, i mean he was working with um theater lighting directors and stuff very early on and doing really progressive stuff with stage and visuals and music videos and i mean I, that's something i find really inspiring when you kind of take the treat all the videos and the art album artwork and all that stuff as part of the universe of the music and try and expand the universe and make it more a place you can kind of live in and not to mention you know all the amazing world music and african music that he's kind of gotten out there and and um you know someone who's like a huge fan of haitian music he's someone i look to who's been able to shine a spotlight on things that a lot of people wouldn't have heard otherwise it's really cool what peter gabriel song should we play for regine maybe oh man can i go w- i mean Anything you want. Oh, we can go it. back. I mean, there's a there's this uh, early Genesis song. I, I think it's called Carpet Crawlers. That sounds like Radiohead or something like before Radiohead. It's a really cool song. There is love. You mentioned Haiti a lot. What, what, what was your first trip there like? Because it made it's obviously had a huge impact on you artistically and aesthetically, and in terms of the sound of Reflector and as you say, the world, the universe around that record is mm-hmm. infused with that location yeah well i mean when i first started dating regine i would always i would go to like her aunt and uncle's house for christmas and all her family is haitian and they would all be speaking in creole and we eat haitian food and i one of her uncles used to be like an ambassador and had this really deep commanding voice and would just give these long monologues about haiti and like so i a lot i learned a lot about the country just from hanging out with her family you know she always wanted to go and her mom i mean her mother and father both had to leave under pretty rough circumstances um during the duvalier regime and her mother in particular was really scarred and didn't want to go back and didn't want regine to go back so after regine's mother passed away she you know was just waiting for her opportunity to go and um we went i mean well before the earthquake we went with paul farmer from partners in health who's 
I don't know. He's as close to like a Gandhi or like a, one of those great people who changes the world that I've ever met. And so getting to see Haiti kind of through his eyes, being in rural Haiti, like on a river at midnight, and there's like a dugout canoe and some because the road has been flooded out, and we're with Paul Farmer making jokes. And um, being in Haiti, the Haitian countryside at night, was really amazing experience because there's just no electricity. Everything's lit by firelight, and you just hear this incredibly deep music. Um, just you meet a farmer who's like, yeah, I'm a singer, and he sings sings a song for you, and it's like pre pre Delta Blues African music that's just lyrically so deep and so incredible. So, yeah, I mean, it's definitely part of who I am. I mean, our family celebrates Carnival like a lot of other families celebrate Thanksgiving or something like that. So it's and you know now now we have a son, and that's kind of part of his heritage too, and. It's somewhere that I'll be going my whole life, and and, uh, it kind of gets under your skin. Not a lot of places like that in the world left. Is there a Haitian artist that we should play at this point? Yeah, there's this group called uh, Ra Ra Fam that we played with down there that's really, really cool. It's it's, uh, Ra Ra music is basically all these monophonic horns and then kind of African drumming, but they kind of dress like salt and pepper, and (laughs) it's kind of like Creole rap on top of... African drumming. It's pretty incredible. I want to ask about New Order because I saw there's a band that you've referenced a lot Mm -hmm. when it comes to Arcade Fire and that kind of, for me, that was like when James Murphy got involved. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like, okay, I could see the connections, I could see the dots being joined. Right. Reflector. Was that one of the reasons why you pursued that more electronic sound? It's always been an influence because when Regine was first learning to play drums, she kind of practiced to New Order. It was kind of that was like something that she could immediately relate to and uh they also are one of those bands that it's more about the band and the and the sound and the music and if you saw someone walking down the street you're not necessarily like oh that's the drummer from new order you know and which i to me that's kind of the dream to be able to make music that people care about a lot and uh not have it just be about yourself you know and also bizarre love triangle is one of the only perfect beautiful songs you can hear like in a pharmacy at least where i'm from it's like just garbage 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 and then bizarre love triangle will come on when you're you know buying advil at the pharmacy and i'm really glad that it's in the world you know there's a live version of that song that i love too if you can make good records for 20 years i think you're you're doing really good you know Uh, there's not a lot of bands so i mean i feel like we're kind of right in the middle of our of our prime right now and I just want to really stay focused on songs and songwriting and keep pushing and seeing what's what's in there what we can what we can do together as a band just because this this tour has really opened I, I feel, feel like musically we're playing so well right now the the rhythm section is better than it's ever been and there's this really kind of exciting musical thing that's been going on on stage live and you know because we got there by learning to play these songs that we wrote and so now i'm kind of curious what what direction that'll go like what that'll bring out of us from a songwriting perspective and the final thing you get to pick the last song we play as well what should we finish on usually when i dj the last song i play is uh, mind games by john lennon so let's go out with that been good to speak to you thank you very much thank you